afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy you've all joined us today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCSH Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSH Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of their needs. To enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Your presenters for today are Sophie Lalonde Bester and Danielle Cassis Akal, who are two third year dietetic students at McGill University. Before continuing, we'd just like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom and that if you have any questions, you could wait until the end of the conference or you could write them down in the chat box on Zoom. And now I'd like to invite our presenters to start their presentation, uh, Eat and Age Well, uh, Heart Healthy Diet. Thank you, Caitlin. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining in to our second presentation, which is part of the Brain Boomer series. My name is Danielle, and here is my colleague, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Today, we'll be presenting our second topic, which is heart healthy diet. Um, we will be also having a food demonstration like last time with about a Mediterranean pasta salad with a chocolate mousse dessert. So I think most of us have found the chat box. Did anyone uh, not find it yet? So let's test our chat box with this question. What is your favorite food? You can write in in the chat box. We, wanna, you, we want you guys to make us hungry. Tell us your favorite food. Chocolate, wow. We're seeing two chocolates. Oh, another oh, one. Yeah. All you guys that like chocolate, you're in luck because our dessert today is a chocolate dessert. Ice cream, pizza, and pasta. Nice. All right. Awesome. It looks like everyone is okay with the chat box, but of course, let us know if you're not. Okay, so what is on the menu today? We'll start by explaining the basics of heart disease and the different risk factors. Then we'll explain the basic of nutrition for heart health we'll, and we'll give you some practical tips. Then we'll have our food demonstration, which my colleague Sophie will show you how she prepared her delicious pasta salad and with the protein pack chocolate mousse. And finally, we'll discuss some food safety and leftover tips. All right, so let's dive right in with a quick introduction on heart disease. Chances are you've heard this term or the term cardiovascular disease. We'll just do a quick introduction. So cardiovascular disease is not just one condition. It actually encompasses a group of conditions that affect the structure and the functions of the heart. If you know someone who has heart disease or if you have heart disease yourself, Know that you are not alone. This affects 1.3 million Canadians and is very common. There is no single root cause of cardiovascular disease. In fact, there's many root causes, which we call risk factors. And healthy lifestyle behaviors play a huge role in whether you develop heart disease or in preventing another event. So some conditions that you may have heard of that can lead to strokes and heart attacks include angina, arrhythmia, high blood pressure or hypertension, and congestive heart failure. So who is at higher risk for developing heart disease? So there's a set of risk factors, some of which are preventable and some of which are not preventable. If we talk about some of the not preventable ones that you can't really control, um, men are at higher risk and men over the age of 45 and women over the age of 50 are at higher risk. Same with if you have any family history of heart disease. If we look at some of the more preventable risk factors, um, cigarette smoke is one of them, having high blood pressure or high cholesterol, having diabetes or having an unhealthy body weight. 
So what can you do to manage your risk of heart disease? One thing you can do is reduce your stress levels because high stress has been associated with high blood pressure, which can lead to heart disease. So getting a good night's sleep, um, doing activities with people you love, or even doing yoga or breathing exercises can actually manage your risk of heart disease. Same with limiting your alcohol consumption and drinking in moderation. So, um, so can being physically active and also being smoke free. And then what Danielle and I are here to talk to you about today is eating a healthy diet. So why bother even eating a healthy diet? Can it actually make a difference? Well, actually eating an overall healthy diet reduces a majority of the controllable risk factors that we talked about. Eating a healthy diet can help you maintain a healthy body weight, maintain healthy cholesterol levels and a normal blood pressure, and even maintain normal blood sugar levels. But then also on a non-scientific basis, Eating a healthy diet can also just make you feel energized, strengthen your immune system, and help you feel good. So if we look at kind of a snapshot of Canada right now, 8 out of 10 Canadians say that nutrition is important when choosing foods, so at the grocery store, at the restaurant, or whatever. But 60% of the foods that we buy are processed and packaged. And many of these processed and packaged foods are high in sugars, sodium, and saturated fat. And this is just a little hint at what we're going to talk about today. So did you know that two-thirds of the packaged foods that we buy in the grocery store have sugars added to them? And then three-quarters of the sodium that we eat comes from these packaged and processed foods. And then one third of the fat that we eat comes from snacks and fast food. So what does a healthy balanced diet look like? And so you might remember from last week's presentation that we did on osteoporosis and bone health, we showed you guys Canada's food guide. And this is Canada's food guide, healthy balanced plate model. So even though we're going to dive into specifics today, like saturated fat and sugar and fiber and sodium and all that good stuff, you can always come back to Canada's Food Guide Healthy Balanced Plate Model to know what an overall healthy balanced diet looks like. So remember that your plate should always have plenty of vegetables and fruit. You should have whole grain foods and you should choose a variety of protein foods. And then last, make water your drink of choice. So you can always fall back on this anchor. With that, we're going to dive right in and we're going to start by discussing fats and oils. So fat is an important for our overall health, but fat tends to get a very bad reputation. And in fact, that all, not all fat are created equally. So what are the different types of fat? We have the saturated fat, the trans fat, and the unsaturated fat, which include the monounsaturated fat and the polyunsaturated fat. So let's start with the saturated fat. Saturated fat is an unhealthy form of fat that is naturally found in foods, in animal foods, such as in fatty cuts of meat, in poultry with skins, and higher fat options like milk, cheese, and yogurt. Saturated fat can also be found in tropical oils, like coconut and palm oil. And other fo food that contains saturated fat include deep fries um, and deep, deep fried food like fries. So for the trans fat, trans fat is also an unhealthy form of fat. So it is made out of the liquid oil that has been changed into solid fat. It is most often found in commercially baked food, in fried food, in processed food, like salty snacks and frozen food. And trans fat can also be found naturally in some food like in meat, milk, and butter, which naturally contains small amount of trans fat. So the trans fat found in them is quite different from the manufactured uh, trans fat. So it does not increase your risk of heart disease. So why saturated and trans fat are unhealthy forms of fat? It's because they can raise your blood cholesterol and hence increases your risk of heart disease. So this is why it's important to limit our intake from saturated fat and avoid trans fat. Now, did you know that Health Canada has banned trans fat? So now it's illegal for manufacturers to add trans fat to food sold in Canada. So you can just uh, check the nutrition fact table to verify. Now for the unsaturated fat, 
the, both monounsaturated fat and, and polyunsaturated fat are healthy forms of fat. M monounsaturated fat can be found in plant-based foods and oil. Polyunsaturated fat like omega-3 and omega-6 can be found in fish and in some nuts and seeds. So those are the healthy forms of fat because they can reduce our blood cholesterol levels and hence can reduce our risk of heart disease. So we need to have moderate intake from them. Now, what is omega-3? You might have heard about a lot about it. So it's a healthy polyunsaturated fat that you can only get from your diet and hence the name essential. Omega-3 has also been shown to protect against heart disease, especially for those who have suffered from heart attack uh, or those who have high triglyceride levels in, uh, in their blood. So we have three types of omega-3. We have the ALA and EPA, and we have the DHA. The ALA and EPA, we can find them in fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, sardines, and the DHA, we can get it from plant food like flaxseed, walnut, and soy products. And because omega-3 have essential role in our diet, actually Health Canada recommends having at, at least two servings of fish per week and preferably fatty fish, which is rich in omega-3. And there are also other foods that have added omega-3 in them like eggs, margarine, cows, cow's milk, yogurt, soy beverage. You just also need to look at the food label and the nutrition fact table to make sure that omega-3 has been added. Now, how can you choose healthier fat? First of all, you can limit your intake from saturated fat to no more than 10% of your daily calories or around 20 grams in the whole day. To lower your intake, you can try to reduce your intake from butter, lard, uh, shortening, cream, fried food like deep fries, um, fatty cuts of meat, and cheese with more than 20% of milk fat. I know sometimes it might be difficult to avoid butter at all costs, but try to limit as much as possible and be con uh, conscious about how much you, you are eating from those foods. And additionally, you can also substitute with healthier forms of fat, which are the unsaturated fat, like the fish, which is rich in omega-3, nuts and seed, vegetable oils like olive oil and canola oil. But remember, even when you're choosing your oil to limit to two to three tablespoons throughout your whole day as part of a healthy diet. Now, here we have a small activity for you. Let's help Mrs. J in her shopping. She's trying to limit high saturated fat items because of her heart condition. Which should she get, the salmon or the bacon? So you can write, write your response in the chat box. Perfect, we're getting responses, salmon. Seeing yeah. two salmon, three salmon. Perfect. Ah, it seems to be pretty unanimous. You get the idea. Perfect, Perfect. so you got it right. Salmon, uh, although salmon is a fatty fish, but it contains a good amount of fat. So, uh, and it contains a good type of fat. So it contains the omega-3. Bacon, on the other hand, is a processed food that is high in saturated fat, and it's also very high in sodium. So for our next thing, which should she get, the first or the second mozzarella cheese? Now, although it might appear small here, but where if you can look at the milk fat percentage, the first one has 28% milk fat, and the second one has 20% milk fat. So you can write in the chat box, perfect. Okay, I'm seeing some of the 20% ones and the one on the right. So both are shredded. Yeah, most perfect. Most are saying pizzarella, pizza mozzarella or the 20%. So you also got it right. We always, we try to choose the lower milk fat option or this, in this case, the second one. And also when you're trying to choose um, um, cheese, try to choose the one with that have a lower milk fat uh, percentage or even less than 20%. And if you can remember from, from last time, we said cheese are excellent source of calcium and also have very good amount of protein. So it should, it can be part of our diet. And I would also like to add here that the key here is in moderation. So if you want to have a high fat fee, uh, cheese or once in a time you want to have bacon in your sandwich, you can do so, but always try to be mindful of what you're eating and try to follow the Canada's food guide as much as possible. 
Now, how can Mrs. J reduce her saturated fat in her cooking? So she can try by using healthy cooking methods like braising or baking her meat and, and steaming her vegetables instead of frying them. She can also use nonstick pan to reduce her fat in cooking. She can also substitute uh, fat in baking with non-sweetened uh, applesauce. She can have it one by one uh, ratio. She can remove the skin of poultry and trim visible fat from meat before cooking them to reduce the amount of saturated fat in her food. And finally, she can season her vegetables with herbs and spices rather than using cream or butter. And one additional tip is she can also choose plant food more often. So as we know, most plant food like beans have little to no fat in them. So if she can substitute the, some portion of her meat with legumes, like in a chili or in, not, in a, another dish, the, this could be a great way where she can reduce the amount of fat in her meals. Now, what about cholesterol? So cholesterol is a substance that our body needs to work properly. And you might have not known this, but our body uh, synthesizes cholesterol. Our body makes cholesterol, or around, and it makes around 75% of the cholesterol that uh, it is present in our body. So, but we can also find cholesterol in animal-based food, like in cheese, egg, shellfish, and meat. However, we can't find we don't find uh, any cholesterol in plant food. So, if you're wondering if if your dietary cholesterol affects your blood cholesterol, the answer is mostly no. However, this is only true for healthy individuals. The amount of cholesterol that we get uh, from food is usually has little impact on our blood cholesterol. Then what affects our blood cholesterol? It is the saturated and trans fat. Those have the biggest impact on, on our blood cholesterol and it's not the amount of uh, cholesterol that people eat. But if you have diabetes, heart disease, or high blood cholesterol, as we have previously mentioned, you will need to control your dietary cholesterol, and also you will need to follow your physician and dietitian advice in that case. So here we have a debated subject in relation to cholesterol. Can eggs be part of a healthy diet? So the answer is yes. If you have normal blood cholesterol and you do not have a history of heart disease, eggs can be eaten in moderation as any other food as part of a healthy diet. Remember, the balanced plate has eggs in them. So why is that? First, first thing, eggs are nutritious. They are nutrient-packed. The egg yolk contains many important vitamins like vitamin A, D, uh, folate, and vitamin B12. And the egg whites provides a good source of high-quality uh, protein. And finally, although the egg yolk has high amount of cholesterol, it is low in saturated fat, and it is the saturated fat that we need to avoid. Okay, so now we are all experts in fats and oils, and as we've seen from the chat box, you guys are all very knowledgeable. So we are going to flip the page, and now we're going to talk about carbohydrates to add to our nutrition knowledge. So there are two main types of carbohydrates. There are complex and simple carbohydrates. We'll start with the complex ones. These take longer to digest in our intestines, and these are high in fiber and other nutrients, and they provide long lasting energy because they do take longer to absorb. So complex carbohydrates are often found in foods that have whole grain, whole wheat, or starches, and they're also found in the fiber of fruits and vegetables. Whereas on the other hand, simple carbohydrates are more easily digested and they actually spike our blood sugar because our body absorbs them so quick. Simple carbohydrates are often low in fiber and they provide empty calories, meaning that, meaning that they provide really rapid energy um, without really sustaining us. So simple carbohydrates are found in refined sugar foods like white bread or sweets or juices and pop and candies. So let's expand on the sugar and the simple carbohydrates a little bit so I can clarify. So there's two types of sugar. There is natural sugars, which are found, as you can guess, naturally in foods. 
Then there's also added sugars, which are added in the manufacturing and processing um, steps. So let's start with natural sugars. These are found naturally in foods like fruits and dried fruits. Also milk, because lactose is a natural sugar. Also all whole grains and legumes um, and vegetables. Whereas added sugar is found in things, as you can guess, like Coke and cake and sweets. Then there's also hidden added sugars in foods like ketchup, flavored yogurts, and salad dressings. So we're really going to focus today mostly on added sugars in the context of heart disease. So here's a true or false question for you. You can put your answer in the chat box. So true or false, we should eliminate all sugar from our diet. What do you think? So we're getting okay. false? No. So most people are saying false. There's one true. And one true. All right. Okay, so it seems to be mostly false and no's. Let's reveal the answer. So the answer is indeed false. Cutting out all sugar would require us to cut out all grains, dairy products, and fruits, which as you can imagine would be nearly impossible. What we should do, however, is try to limit our added sugar. And actually, the Heart and Stroke Foundation recommends consuming no more than 10% of our total calories per day from added sugars. So this comes out to 12 teaspoons of added sugars per day. What does this look like, you might ask? So let's focus on this can of pop, the standard can of pop. One can of pop has about 10 teaspoons of sugar or 10 sugar cubes, which is almost 100% of our daily needs of added sugar. That's a lot. And then if we focus on this strawberry flavored yogurt, surprisingly, one serving of this yogurt has seven teaspoons of added sugar, which really is almost as much as the can of pop. So hidden sugar is really, um, we need to be aware of it. And then even this salad dressing, um, any commercial salad dressing, one serving has about one and a half teaspoons of added sugar. So we need to be really wary of this. Here's another true or false for you. Brown sugar, honey, and maple syrup are healthier than white sugar. Let us know what you think, true or false. We're getting two trues and three trues and two false. This one seems a little trickier. We seem to be a little bit more divided. Okay, good job everyone. Thanks for participating. So indeed, the answer is false. Our body metabolizes all sugars in the same way. Sugar is sugar. So contrary to common belief, it's important to limit all kinds of added sugars. So no matter how healthy or natural these sugars are marketed to be, in our body, they're metabolized in just the same way. So how can we reduce our added sugar in some practical tips? So here are some ideas that Danielle and I have for you. So instead of adding sugar or brown sugar or maple syrup to sweeten your oatmeal or your cereal, top your bowl with your favorite fruit. Because as we know, fruit has some natural sugar, so you can still get some sweetness. Then you can also get some fiber and you don't need to add that added sugar. Or you can opt for low calorie or sugar-free drinks instead of sugar-sweetened beverages like Coke or juices. And better yet, you can drink water. Then you can enjoy fruit for dessert instead of cookies or pastries, because again, these have natural sugars. Or you can cut the amount of sugar that you use in recipes for cakes and cookies to half and see how you like these. But overall, remember to cook at home more often and choose whole foods. Because whole foods, there's no way of sneaking in that um, added sugar, or, um, adding that hidden sugar. So whole foods are always the best bet. So we've talked a little bit about sugar. Now let's switch gears and talk about fiber. So what is fiber? Fiber, it is a type of carbohydrate that we cannot digest. It is uh, found in plants, food, so in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. 
Now, why fiber is important? It is important because it can help us have regular bowel movement. It can help us lower our blood cholesterol and it can also help us control our blood sugar. In fact, in research, they have found that fiber may also help you maintain a healthy body weight. They, it can also lower your risk of heart disease and can lower your risk of some cancer like colon cancer. Now, even with the old benefits that fiber provides, unfortunately, Canadians today are only getting about half of the amount of fiber that they need in a day. So you might be wondering where can we find fiber and how much do we need from it? So let's start by how much do we need from, from it? Men above 51 years old need about 30 grams of fiber per day and women above, 50, above 51 years old need about 21 grams of fiber per day. Now, where can we find fiber? We can find them in most fruits and vegetables, but most especially in berries like raspberries, blackberries, and apples with peels, and even within dried fruits, like dried prunes and figs. But remember to choose non-sweetened ones. We can also find them in vegetables like cauliflower, sweet potatoes, we can also find it in whole grain products. So you can choose products that have whole grains in the ingredient list, like whole wheat, whole oats. We can find it in oatmeal and some of my favorites, uh, air popped um, popcorn. And finally, we can find fiber in legumes, nuts, and seeds, like beans, chickpeas, as we'll see later in our recipe, lentils, and split, uh, split peas. Now, Let's help Mrs. J again, she needs help. She's trying to add fiber rich food into her breakfast. Now here is her breakfast, she's having half a cup of orange juice with two white toast and one egg. How can she improve her fiber intake? So please put your answers in the box. We'll give you guys a little bit of time to think and type that out. So how can Mrs. J add some fiber to her breakfast? She's having some orange juice, some white toast, and an egg. So we got brown toast and add fruits instead of juice. That's great. Dilute orange juice with water. I think this would, wouldn't add fiber to it. Um, have, have some fruits, make toast, whole wheat, and or an orange too. Yes, yeah, so we're getting whole wheat toast, which is great. The fruits instead of the juice, that's great. Add some, some berries, nice. Good job, everyone. So- Okay, these are all such great ideas. Yeah, they are. So those are some of the answers that Sophie and I came with. Um, she can substitute her regular bread with whole uh, grain bread, like most of you have said, or even with a rye bread. She can add avocados on her toast. Avocados are rich in fiber, so she, that's good for her. She can eat the fruit instead of the juice. So have an orange instead of orange juice or apple with peels or even have half a cup of berries. One of you have suggested that, that too. And or alternatively, she can have oatmeal on the side with fruits on top. Oatmeal also is rich in fiber. So um, to make it more balanced, also we have suggested that maybe she can add some more protein food sources like peanut butter, yogurt, or cheese to increase her protein in her breakfast. So here is the comparison between her breakfast and what we have suggested. So two grams in her uh, previous uh, breakfast, and now she'll be getting about 15 grams of fiber. So with that one meat, one breakfast or one meal, she's having about 70% of what she needs from fiber. Now, what about sodium? Sodium is a mineral that is essential for life. It is actually regulated by our kidney and it helps control our body fluid balance. And you might be confused between what is sodium and what is salt. Sodium is what, what's found in food and especially in processed food. And salt is what we add to, to the food. So now we have here a true or false question. Uh, most of our sodium intake comes from salt that we add during cooking or at the table. So you can respond in the chat box. 
I'm seeing some falses, Danielle. Oh, I'm seeing one true. Oh, everyone is so engaged. It's lots of fun to see all your answers in the chat yeah. box. Thank you so much for participating. We're getting mostly false and some true. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, uh, the answer is actually false. The majority of our intake comes from processed food or 75% of our intake from salt comes from processed food and only 15% comes from salt we add to our food or at the table. So this is important because processed foods are high in sodium, but are low in other key nutrients, which is potassium. And in fact, potassium, which is typically found in whole food like fruits, vegetables, and whole grain and legumes can help us maintain and manage our blood pressure. Uh, it can do that by reducing the negative effect of sodium. So next time when you're in the supermarket, maybe if you can look at the nutrition fact table of processed food and try to know the difference in the amount of sodium and potassium in, in those foods. Now, is sodium so bad that we need to avoid it completely? The answer is no. We all need some sodium, but most of us are consuming about double of what we need in a day. So healthy adults only need about 1,500 milligrams of sodium in a day. Now, why is that? Having too much sodium in our blood can increase the amount of blood in our uh, arteries, which can increase our blood pressure. And this will, can increase our risk of uh, heart disease and even stroke. Now, here we have a small activity for you. Which of those foods are high in sodium? So here, the examples of food are pickles, chips, chicken broth, deli meat, cheese pocket, bouillon cube, and soy sauce. So you can write your answer in the box. We'll give you some time to type it out. Yes. Oh, you guys are catching on. Yes, that's great. So most of the answers are that all these foods have sodium. Some are picking certain foods. Okay, the big reveal. <laughs> so the answer is all of them. So those are known as hidden source of sodium. Other items that could be added to this list are like cake mix, ketchup, or other types of frozen dinners. Now, this is contrary to what we think about high salt food, which we think it needs to taste salty for it to be in high in salt. Well, in fact, most of those processed food have added sodium to them during their processing and they don't need to taste salty. So what can you do to decrease your uh, salt intake? We have prepared a few tips for you. So at home, you can prepare your own meals using little or no salt. So you can make your own soup, sauce, and salad dressing like we did last time and like you will see in this time too. You can enjoy more fresh or frozen uh, vegetables and fruits. And when you want to consume canned food, ma make sure you, want, you, you rinse carefully uh, with water to wash away some of the sodium. You can also taste your food before adding salt and try to flavor your food with herbs and spices instead. And finally, you can also try and choose whole foods like we have showed you uh, in the Canada's food guide and in the balance plate. So those food won't be having any added salt and they won't be having any added saturated fat or even sugar. So when you're eating out, you can choose wisely. So you can ask for gravy sauce, for gravy sauce and salad on the side and use only small portion uh, and add to it to your food. And you can also flavor your food using lemon or pepper instead of uh, using the salt sauce or uh, gravy. And finally, in your grocery trip, you can read the information on the food package. So you can compare food labels and choose products that have less than 15% of daily value from sodium. You can also buy unsalted or low sodium options whenever possible, like low salt soup or no added canned beans. Now let's put what we have learned today into practice. We have here two meat lasagna products and based on that, which one would you choose? Also, if you can write your answer in the box. So here, 
because of the, the, the first page didn't have any nutrition uh, information. So I'll proceed with examining the nutrition fact table. So based on the nutrition fact table, which one would you choose? We're getting some number one and one number two. You guys are really good at this. You're really fast too at reading the nutrition fact table. There's a lot of information on these. It can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming. So most of you have answered number one. Let's try and read it all together and find out if it's number one or number two. So as we have learned last time, when we're comparing two different nutrition fact table, we first need to look at the serving size. So the first one was 300 grams and the se second one is 333 grams, which is in comparison, it's not a lot of difference. So then if we look after the serving size, you can also notice the difference in calories. The first one has 320 and the sec second one has 620, which is double the amount of calories. But for this case, let's try and continue with, the, with reading the label. So the first one has uh, five grams of saturated fat. The second one has 20 uh, grams of saturated fat. So the second one is higher in saturated fat. And the first one has 710 milligrams of sodium. The second one has 1250 milligrams of sodium or around 50% of our daily value from sodium. So based on all of that, we would still, I would choose the, the second product because uh, I would choose the first product, I'm sorry, because it's lower in saturated fat and it's lower in sodium. And even if it has a lower protein content, it still contains the amount of protein that is needed in a meal, which is more than 20 grams of protein. So as most of you have guessed, yes, it is uh, the first product that we would choose. All right, so now we've practiced all this business of saturated fat and sugars and sodium, et cetera, um, looking mainly at nutrition facts tables and processed foods. But now let's practice all this stuff um, with a homemade recipe and how you can do this stuff at home in your cooking. So our demonstration today is a delicious Mediterranean pasta salad and a decadent chocolate mousse. So you've all received, or you should have received in an email from Caitlin, our delicious recipes. Um, otherwise, um, Caitlin will send them to you after the workshop. Um, but this is the Mediterranean pasta salad matrix that we have created for you. So it's a great way to build your own delicious pasta salad. So I'll run you through it. So one recipe serves three to four. And what you'll need is 200 grams of pasta or about half a box of any kind of your favorite pasta. Then you'll need to choose four veggies for a total of two cups. You can choose four veggies of your choice. You'll need a third of a cup of chopped herbs or alternatively, you could use two tablespoons of dried herbs. Then you'll need a cup of a protein source, whether it be chicken breast, chickpeas or tuna. Then you can use some delicious optional add-ins like feta, mozzarella, or olives, and we'll show you how to build your own delicious, healthy salad dressing. And then this is the decadent chocolate mousse recipe that you've also received. Um, note that the special ingredient in this mousse is silken or soft tofu. And I know there's probably some tofu skeptics in the group, or some of you might not have ever even tried tofu, um, but silken tofu is a really great dessert option. It's a really soft product and doesn't have any taste. And so it's perfect for a mousse. And when I went to the grocery store, I took pictures of where I found my silken tofu in my local grocery store. And it's often in the produce section um, at a counter titled plant-based alternatives or something similar. And I found it with the rest of the tofus. But make sure that when you're looking for soft or silken tofu, that you're not choosing any extra firm or any other kind of tofu. Be sure to read the label properly. 
So I hope that that clears some stuff up there. And then we're using a blender or a food processor in the recipe today. So we don't want you ending up like the picture here. So make sure when you're using a blender or a food processor to keep your fingers out, don't overfill it and only blend for a short amount of time. So you don't overheat your machine. Take caution with hot liquids, of course, and then stop and scrape down the sides every once in a while to make sure everything is evenly blended. So with that, let's get into the demo. We're just gonna let our video load here. So, and don't worry, if you haven't received the recipe, um, you will receive it from Caitlin or in an email after. So, the first step is to wash your hands, of course. And then the pasta that I decided to use today was a whole grain wheat pasta. And this box has 375 grams, so I used approximately half of it. So I cooked the pasta according to the package instructions. And then when I drain my pasta, I rinsed it under cold water so it could cool really quickly since we're making a cold pasta salad. And then I set it aside in a large bowl for later. And then the four veggies that I chose were cucumber, red onion, bell pepper, and grape tomatoes. And I chopped these up to have a total of two cups. The herb that I chose was fresh parsley, and I chopped this up to have a third of a cup. Alternatively, I could have used two tablespoons of dried herbs. The protein that I chose was a can of chickpeas, and I chose a no salt added can of chickpeas. And then I rinsed my chickpeas to get rid of all the foam. But remember, you can always use chicken breast or tuna if you prefer. The optional add-ins that I chose were feta and black olives. I chose about a quarter cup of each. And now to build our own dressing. So I start with two tablespoons of olive oil. Remember that olive oil is a great source of monounsaturated fats. So this is the kind that I like to use. I love how you're using the mason jar to prepare your dressing. Oh yeah, you'll see why I like to use a mason jar for my salad dressings. This is my secret tip. But next I'm adding some red wine vinegar because I love some acidity in my salad dressings. But alternatively, you could use balsamic vinegar if you want. And then I'm using one tablespoon of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And if you want, you could also add some zest from the lemon that you're using if you're choosing to use freshly squeezed so you don't have any waste. And then I'm using a teaspoon of dried oregano. And then last, I'm gonna add one minced garlic clove. So then that's everything that goes into our dressing. It's quite simple. And most of you might have some of the ingredients already. And then here's why I like to use a mason jar for salad dressings. I like to screw on the lid and then all you need to do is shake it up. And then you have a perfect storage container for any extra salad dressing that you wanna keep in the fridge. So here's our assembly. It looks so refreshing, the different colors of the vegetables. This is such a beautiful recipe. It's great for like the start of spring or for bringing to a potluck or a picnic in the park. So many colors. I think it doesn't take a long time to do, right? Oh my gosh, no. I just chopped up all the veggies really quickly while the pasta was cooking. And it's done in like 10, 15 minutes, especially faster if you have the dressing pre-made in the fridge. Yeah. And I really like to chop up all my veggies so that the pieces are about the same size. It makes a really nice texture when you're eating. So you don't have any really big or really small pieces. It truly really looks like the Canada's food guide with the amount of vegetables and the protein and even the whole grains totally totally so then 
I'm putting all the dressing that we made for this recipe. But again, if you wanted to keep um, extra dressing, you could totally keep it in the fridge and use it for later. And then I'm just mixing everything all up. As you can see, it's very simple. And then I decided to add a little bit of black pepper to my salad. I didn't feel the need to add any salt because I used feta, which already has a little bit of sodium in it. Um, and I tasted it and it was just fine for me. And voila, there's our delicious Mediterranean pasta salad. Very simple. So I'll set that aside for now. And then now we're gonna move on to our decadent chocolate mousse. So here's what it looks like, and I'll show you how to get there. This recipe is awesome. It takes five minutes max. So I'm taking three quarters of a cup of chocolate chips, and I melted those in the microwave um, for about two minutes in 30 second increments. And I set that aside. Here's our magic ingredient, our silken or soft tofu. For this recipe, you need one package and it's really simple to use. All you need to do is open it up and then plop it into the food processor or a blender. So can you use any kind of blender to do that? You can use any kind of blender to do this, correct. You can even use like a hand blender as well. And then I'm using maple syrup. I just used about a teaspoon or a tablespoon, sorry, I, I eyeballed it. But I love this recipe because you can really control the amount of sweetness and it's really not too sweet. And then I just blended this up. And as you can see, our silken tofu is really smooth and really creamy and airy. So it's great for a mousse. So can you substitute the tofu with yogurt or? Yeah, actually, that's a great point. If you didn't want to use tofu, I haven't tested it, but you could try with Greek yogurt or even an avocado. I know people make mousses sometimes with avocado. Um, so you could test that out and let us know how it goes. And then the chocolate was cooling on the side and I'm now adding it to the food processor and then just blending it all up. This got a little messy, so I'm scraping down the sides as I go. I wanna make sure everything is well blended. It looks really easy to do. Oh, this recipe is so easy and you'll fool everyone. No one will ever guess that there's tofu in here. And you yep. really don't taste it. There is no taste to it. So it, it really just tastes like chocolate. And that is it. It's all nice and creamy and airy and light. And I'm just going to divide it into three bowls, or you could use ramekins if you prefer. And then the mousse could be ready to serve as is, but I like to put it in the fridge for 20 minutes to get cold. I like to eat it um, when it's cold. And there it is. And then you could serve your chocolate mousse with some chocolate shavings or even a mint leaf. I topped my mousse with some berries for some added fiber and a nice little vibrancy. Nice, so you'll get wow. protein and fruits in your dessert. That's really cool. Oh yeah. So here's my delicious balanced meal and I sat down to eat this for lunch and it was delicious. <laughs> Nice. Okay. So what did you think about the recipe? I'm seeing a comment from Mary B that you can buy some white plastic covers to replace the two piece mason jar cover. And actually I have some of these at home as well. Also very handy. Do you have any other comments about the recipes Is something you would like to try at home? Or do you have any questions about other things you could replace the ingredients with? Thanks, Donna. Yeah, it looks so appetizing. It is very appetizing. And you can always let us know if you try these recipes before the next workshop. And you can even show us pictures if you want. We'd love to see those. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Alexandra. Okay, I have, I, it's something I started to do. I used to love the flavored yogurt, but then I found that I had a lot of sugar. 
So I discovered Astro plain yogurt. It only has three ingredients, Astro. And I just get the plain one, which is really not very flavorful. And I add a tablespoon of strawberry jam. And it's a strawberry yogurt. It's delicious. That's a great tip. Yeah, plain yogurt's a really great option. And it's a little hard to get used to sometimes. Yeah, or but whatever you can do to make it more appetizing for you, that's apricot great. Apricot jam, apricot jam, anything. Yeah, really works for me. Thanks for sharing. And definitely anyone who doesn't have the recipes from today, you will get them. If you have not received them, you'll be getting them from Caitlin. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about the nutrition in these recipes. So I love this pasta salad because even though all the ingredients are all mixed up, you can see that it still follows the Canada's Food Guide balanced plate model. We have a ton of colorful fruits and vegetables. We're using a whole grain source by using the whole wheat pasta. And then we have an excellent protein source from the chickpeas. Um, we also, we made our own salad dressing. So we know that there's no added sugars or hidden sources of sodium. So that's great. And then the olive oil provides a great source of monounsaturated fat. And then if we look at the nutrition facts table, there is a little bit of saturated fat. There's 2.5 grams. This is likely from the feta that I added. Um, I love cheese. I love feta. So I used a little bit and it made it delicious for me, but you could always omit this if you want. We have 13 grams of fiber, which is almost half of our daily needs. And then again, our sugar and sodium is quite low because we know that we didn't add any into our salad dressing or didn't add any um, salt um, to our plate. And then for the chocolate mousse, this is our nutrition facts table here. What we should know is that chocolate is actually a source of saturated fat because chocolate is made from cocoa butter. But I mean, as we know from the start of today's lecture, we all love chocolate. Most of us love chocolate. And so everything in moderation, right? Um, if you have dark chocolate, dark chocolate has a ton of added benefits from all the compounds in there. So if you can use that, go ahead. Um, but this recipe is also great because it has three grams of fiber and we have seven grams of protein um, from the tofu. And then we can also control the amount of sugar that we're using in this dessert by adding more or less maple syrup and using a different type of chocolate. So the key here is everything in moderation. And this dessert has a ton of added benefits on the side while also um, satisfying that sweet tooth. And then in addition, these are also really budget friendly recipes. One portion of the salad costs me $3.10. And then one portion of the dessert costs me $1.25. So you might be wondering what to do with that massive bowl of pasta salad that you make. Of course, you can half the recipe if that's all you're going to need. But both the salad and the mousse will keep in the fridge for two to three days if you cover both with plastic wrap or beeswax wrappers or place them in Tupperwares. What I like to do when I make a big batch of pasta salad is divide it into Tupperware so that my lunch for the next day is ready to grab and go from the fridge. Um, another thing that I like to do is I like to keep extra dressing in the mason jar in the fridge. And I like to add maybe a teaspoon um, to my day old salad just to freshen it up. Cause sometimes pasta salad can dry up a little bit in the fridge. It's nice to, to brighten it up. And then as you can guess, neither of these recipes will keep in the freezer. So keep them in the fridge. So hopefully you've learned a great deal today about heart healthy eating. Hopefully it wasn't too much of an information overload. Um, if that was the case, you can always look back at these resources. The Heart and Stroke Foundation has a ton of great information. They have recipes and advice and they have a whole web page on healthy living recipes that I personally love. I love these recipes, so I recommend that you check them out. Of course, Canada's Food Guide is always a great resource. And then if you're looking to add more um, plant-based foods to your diet, such as the recipe we showed you, pulses.org and lentils.org are great websites if you're looking for inspiration on how to use legumes in your cooking. Um, and lentils.org actually does a great job of showing 50-50 recipes of meat and lentils. If you're trying to kind of wean yourself off meat and a chili, for example, they have some great recipes for how to add lentils to your cooking.
So thank you everyone for attending today and for participating in the chat box. So feel free to ask us if you have any more questions that we can respond. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. Um, we do have a question in the chat box. Someone would like to know if they can use applesauce instead of tofu in the chocolate mousse. I don't know if that would have really the same texture. Um, you could always try and report back to us and let us know, but I think you would need something a little bit more creamy. I have a question. Yeah. About re you mentioned replacing app replacing is it butter with applesauce and baking? Is it really one to one? Let's say it says a half a cup of butter, so it's a half a cup of applesauce. Yep, I've done it before, um, and it doesn't produce like it, it kind of produces the same texture. The taste might be a little bit different, um, but I recommend if you're trying to make like muffins or cookies or a cake um, to give it a shot. I've done it before, and that's what I do when I cook too. So. So it's up, it can replace oil as well, right? Vegetable oil, a cup of, yeah. Exactly. So one-to-one -one for the fat in your recipe. Yes. Okay, I'll try that. And if you want, Alexandra, another good tip is to just go half the amount of oil or butter too. Right. Yeah. At least start that way and see how it works out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, ladies. Yes, I, I thought that there was a, a couple questions about the daily value of sodium on nutrition labels. And we omitted to include this in the presentation just for the sake of time. Um, but on the nutrition labels, you are correct, whoever brought it up, that the percent daily value is actually based on the tolerable upper limit of sodium, which is a higher value than the 1500 milligrams that's recommended. Um, so that might be a little bit extra information. Perfect. We also have a question here. It says, is heart disease still considered higher risk for men? I thought they determined that women were underdiagnosed for heart attacks. So, so I, the re oh yeah, sorry, Danielle, go ahead. ahead. So I think it's like higher risk for men. It's all the kind of heart disease. So um, the underdiagnosed for heart attack, it's more only one kind or one consequence of heart disease, but like all heart disease are, men are at risk for most of them, like most of the heart disease other than the heart attack, like hypertension, like the other uh, heart disease that we have previously mentioned. Uh, we have another one here. It says, when we buy something that is fat-free, I always worry that they add more sugar for flavor. Is that the case? Yeah, that can definitely be the case. Manufacturers, their main goal is to get you to buy their product. So whatever will make it tasty, they want, um, they want to do that. Um, so it's always important not to just default to the, the marketing um, phrases on the front of packages. Now that you have the skills to read nutrition facts tables, I'd recommend that you, you challenge those claims and you look at the nutrition facts tables to really make the best choice for you. I have another question, cottage cheese. I always order cottage cheese with 14% fat because I've tried the other one, which is I don't know, 2% or 5 and I don't find it as tasty. And when I looked at the, nutrition, the, the ingredients or the, the nutritive value, um, to me, it didn't really make much difference i don't know am i wrong there I, don't I wasn't know. able to hear your your question your your mic i think it's like far oh um, cottage cheese yeah. I prefer, is it a little better now yes it is better okay. so i always fine. order i always buy 14 percent because i find there's much more flavor there than in the one with what is it two percent or five percent uh, that one is also very runny liquidy so am I doing the wrong thing? Uh, typically for cheese, whatever, whatever cheese less than 20% of milk fat is good. So 14% is good. Okay. Yes. All right. That's what I wanted to know because it's very good. <laughs> if you compare the fats, it's going to be, you're going to see slightly less saturated fat in the 2%. Um, so it really is a preference taste and it's, it's moderation as well with the saturated fat. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, we have a bit more of a, I guess, a technical question. Someone would like to know how you guys made your video. Was it with a GoPro? Uh, no, unfortunately, I'm not that high tech. I just used my iPhone and I got really creative with propping it up. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> great, great professionals. We have another one here. It says, is plant-based butter better? So that's a great question. And it really depends on like what you're exactly looking for. Plant-based butter is often made with vegetable oils that have been solidified into margarine. Um, what I can tell you is that vegetable oils are higher in monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. So in that sense, they could be better. Um, one thing that's also good to look for with margarines is looking for plant sterols. That's a really um, cool ingredient that can kind of counter the effects of cholesterol. So often plant-based butters will have sterols. Um, so that's always an added bonus if you want to choose a margarine that has that ingredient. I don't know if Danielle, you had anything to add to that answer? Yes. And like, I would add like to add, always try to choose more the, the oil. So like the canola and the olive oil that we previously discussed, they also, other than they have uh, unsaturated fat, they have better ratio of the unsaturated fat. Whereas sometimes in margarine, they tend to have like higher omega-6 compared to the omega-3. So this is sometimes even um, controversial, controversial for, for the margarine and the plant-based butter. So always look at the nutrition fact table and um, always try to compare product whenever you, which, whichever product you want to choose. So we have now a question. Uh, should we choose margarine or butter? So margarine now don't, don't have any kind of added trans fat. Previously it had. Now it's illegal to uh, add any trans fat to margarine. Um, butter, on the other hand, have high amount of saturated fats. So whichever product you want to choose, even like the olive oil, I think it's, it's the best olive oil and other kind of vegetable oils are the best kind of oils. But if you want to choose the margarine or butter, always try to be conscious about the amount that you're choosing. So if you want to have butter, you can have it, but like have it in moderation and always try to rely on the, on the oils, the olive oil, the canola oil and those kind of oils. So is olive oil based on margarine better than butter? Is olive oil based or margarine better than oil, you mean? Olive oil is much better than margarine or butter. Perfect, we also had another question a little bit earlier. It says, what is, a, what is the tolerable level of daily intake of sugar for an individual who does not have diabetes? That's a great question. And that's a little tough to answer because um, sugar on like nutrition labels often includes both natural and added sugars. So really it's a tough question to answer because we like, we want to say eat fruits and stuff, but that has added or natural sugars. sorry. Um, but the Heart and Stroke Foundation recommends um, having no more than 10% of your daily total calories from added sugar. So that's our 12 teaspoons that we talked about. So that's the, I think that's the best, most general answer that we can give you. Perfect. Okay. So now we have another question. So is, uh, now I understood the question, is olive oil based margarine better than butter? If it's only based on olive oil, it could be better, but still when they're doing the margarine, they're having uh, like processing stuff. So even when it's olive oil based margarine or any kind of vegetable oil based margarine, always be the make sure that the ingredient list, all the nutrition fact table, make sure it is a, a good product. So, but yeah, you can choose an olive oil based margarine or even butter, but even in moderation. Perfect. Are there any other questions for Sophie or Danielle? Oh, we have one here. It says, can we be sure that margarine is not uh, hydrogenated? You mean the high, uh, partially hydrogenated? Like, so partially hydrogenation is the process where they create the trans fat. So now it's illegal for, for manufacturers to have trans fat in food. So margarine should not have any kind of trans fat. 
but sometimes maybe the product was not produced here or, or sometimes it goes unnoticed. So that's why you always need to check the nutrition fact table and the ingredient list. Sometimes they're adding palm kernel oil to it to kind of give it more of that creamier flavor to help it be a bit harder at room temperature. Yes. So it, it really is looking at the ingredient list and the bottom line is doing things in, you know, in moderation um, with the, the butter or margarine that you choose. Really a tough question to answer. <laughs> Perfect. Are there any other questions for Sophia or Danielle? Wait a moment. All right. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for this fantastic presentation. As you can see from the chat box, everyone really enjoyed it. Um, I'm putting into our chat box right now uh, the instructions on how to donate. If you attend any two uh, Eat and Age Well series for this month and you make a donation to the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, you'll receive a complimentary apron. So I have the link uh, in the chat box. And I also have, uh, if you maybe you want to do by check or mail it in, I have our mailing address. Um, or if you're more comfortable by phone, I'll put a phone number as well and you can call her. her name is Sylvana. She's great to talk to. Um, I'll also be including all of this information in an email that I'll be sending you later today. So it might be a little bit easier from the email than to go through the chat box. Um, so I really hope to see you guys next week. It, Sophie and Danielle will be back next week again for another um, uh, installation of our uh, Eat and Age Well series. And I hope everyone has a great day.